Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know that it's uh, difficult to be the last, very last speaker in the program, but I will try to do my best. You know, we have gone through an amazing learning experience, and we have actually experienced how uh, the performance of a company is driven by your individual leadership skills, by global forces or signals, by strategies and choices that companies make. What I want to address tonight is something also very important that my center has been working on for the last four years, and is the importance of talent. You know, next year, 2020, we'll celebrate an amazing uh, World Expo in Dubai, but they're also celebrating a very important anniversary. It's the 125th anniversary of the invention of the cinema. The cinema, the cinematograph, was first patented in Lyon, in France, by two brothers, Auguste and Louis Lumière who managed to come up with this massive invention that revolutionized truly the world by, you know, and, and in a place that nobody would expect it to be a seat of such a revolutionary innovation. Why did the brothers invent the cinema there and at that time? And the answer is very simple. You know, Auguste and Louis Lumière were the sons of a photographer that from humble beginnings made uh, some money and managed to send his two sons uh, to one of the new institutions in France, and particularly Lyon, called La Martinier. La Martinier was at that time the MIT of the 19th century, which was coincidentally funded, founded in Lyon by an entrepreneur that uh, had moved there, and again by chance. So the MIT of the 19th century was not in the United States, was not in Switzerland, was not in the UAE, it was in France and in particular in Lyon. La Martinier was such a technical place that the two brothers learned not only the technology that they needed, but also the innovation skills that gave the route to the invention of the cinema. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. You know, very often, when we look at innovation, we tend to focus on individual skills and we don't realize the importance of the context. My center has started to analyze to what extent countries can shape the talent, not only uh, at the simple level of education, but also to the extent that it contributes to the growth and development of companies. Innovation is obviously driven by several factors. One of them is capital, another one is regulation, but talent is also extremely important. So today what I want to address with you is to what extent countries, policies, choices made by politicians can actually shape how companies can manage and, and attract talent. And that's what we call talent competitiveness. Um, we did a study a few years ago in which we actually show, show that the success of a business Everything else equal actually depends on the interaction of three important factors. The number one is governance. You need to have good internal processes that drive performance. The second one is talent management. Companies that spur, develop, and attract good talent, they also perform well. And finally, innovation, which is probably a result of the previous two. Notice that very often, these three factors of success that we have identified for a large sample of companies are not driven by companies' choices alone. In particular, governance depends entirely on rules. Talent and talent management depends also on, again, the strength to which countries generate those important policies. And at the end of the day, innovation is a result of uh, capital regulation and, again, talent management as well. Okay? If you look at the world map of digital innovation, this has been reported recently by the United Nations Trade and Development Commission on a topic that is extremely interesting that the United Nations call digital inequality. And what you can see here is the distribution of digital platforms across regions in the world. On the left-hand side, you can see the United States. On the right-hand side, you can see Asia and China in particular. And in the middle, you can see pitiful Europe and very small Africa. Latin America is not even there. Okay? What are the drivers of such a digital inequality? Obviously, one can argue that these 
has to do with the fact that you know, in uh, China or in Asia and in the United States, they have better talent. You have a smarter people, okay? And that's not actually the case. Because many innovations that we see today are happening in Europe, are happening in Africa, are happening in Latin America. But they only end up being owned by companies in, those, in these two sides of the world, okay? Capital is a massive driving, for, driving force of this digital inequality. Today, as you can see from this, again, table from the United Nations, 75% of all patents related to blockchain technologies are dominated by the United States and China. And I can continue. So in that, capital is a very important driver of innovation. So it seems that talent is irrelevant. That is, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you have a good innovation skills in a country because you know, capital drives the success of innovations. But look at something that is quite interesting. First of all, the seed of innovation very often is uh, academic institutions. Those countries that promote centers of excellence, they end up with innovation. Uh, FedEx started at Yale University as a graduate project, Reddit, MIT, Time Magazine, Harvard, Facebook, Harvard as well, Yahoo and Google, Stanford University. Whenever you have centers of excellence in education, you have innovation. Do we only have centers of excellence in education in the United States? No. Actually, today there are many countries, you can see King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi, the United Arab Emirates University, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, or in particularly in Switzerland, EPFL, an institution very close to us, IMD, you know, they have developed as centers of innovation that promote talent to just generate ideas. So why do we see that ultimately all of these ideas that result from academic institutions always end up in the same place? And the answer is capital. That is, at the end of the day, you know, if you look at uh, all of these companies, these are all innovations that have been born in Europe. Logitech is a Swiss company. Skype is an Estonian company. LiveRail, Uberview are two ideas from Hungary that have been bought by Hootsuite and Facebook. And the same happened with Avangate, which is a Romanian patent then introduced in the United States through a par private equity partner. What happens with talent and innovation? Once we develop talent, what happens is that then, you know, capital, we attract those ideas into the countries where capital dominates. And with that, capital sucks talent from those countries. So it is extremely important for countries in order to spread innovation to do two things. First, to develop institutions like La Martinière in France or MIT in the United States, or EPFL in Switzerland, but second, to make sure that countries are able not only to attract talent, but also to retain talent. And that's what we try to do in our study of talent competitiveness. For a country to be talent competitive, you basically need to have three ingredients. The first ingredient is a good education policy. You need to generate talent from the beginning. Primary, but also secondary and tertiary education. Second, we need to promote policies which involve many aspects of regulation that uh, attract and retain talent. And finally, we need to also make sure that our organizations develop talent once it is hired. That's also something that has changed with the 21st century. We could hire a school graduate and then put her in a job for life that she could perform very well. Today, that's not possible. We need to hire a graduate and then educate her continuously in order to make sure that she adapts to the new realities. Okay. Again, that's the assessment that we try to make when we look at different countries. And you're going to see now that when I show you the results, you know, the countries that, in principle, look like amazing at generating talent, do not excel in talent competitiveness, because talent competitiveness 
not only requires a good education, but it also requires that you attract retained talent and then you provide developing development for individuals within your organization. And by the way, in one of our studies that we conducted this past year, when it comes to talent attraction and retention, we have actually assessed that the main driver to attract talent, especially at the executive level, is not tax rules, is not the cost of living, is primarily quality of life. That is, executives move across countries looking for better quality of life. And as you can see, you know, for a government, promoting quality of life is not just a question of regulation. It's a long-term journey. Okay? But we find it fundamental that for the future of developing economies, again, Africa and Latin America, for example, the retention of talent is going to be paramount to become a more competitive economy in the coming future. Okay? Let me talk about education first. And what I want to show you here is that when it comes to education, there are three pillars for an excellence education system. An excellence education system or excellent education system you know, is present in several countries, Finland, Singapore, Switzerland, uh, the UAE to some extent. The first ingredient that we need in order to have an excellent education system is money. Okay? And many studies have agreed that investment in education per student is a major driving force of educational results. Here you have a table that shows some statistics from our center in which you can see that in percentage of GDP, there are countries that range from the UAE where the investment in education per student tends to be low because it relies primarily on primary education to South Korea or Denmark that invest more than 20, 25% of the GDP per capita per student on education. The average in the world today is 21%. And that's a massive driving force. I point that out because when you will see the results for the UAE, while the UAE is doing everything extremely well, that's the factor where you can see a certain weakness when it comes to talent competitiveness, which explains its position in the ranking. So the recipe here is very easy. I think we need to increase our investment in education. There are other countries, you can see take, uh, countries that are not surprising like Colombia or South Africa, where the investment is also weak. But also some other surprising countries like Hong Kong or Germany that invest less than the world average in education per capita. So let me show you what we have done and let me show you the results just as a way to explore a discussion. My objective here is to emphasize this idea that policies, the global context, regulation, governments matter a lot to drive growth and profitability of companies because talent is a major driving force of profit and growth for corporations. Um, the IMD World Talent Ranking that we published three days ago, and we launched it here in Dubai, assesses the extent to which nations develop, attract, and retain talent in order to drive the overall competitiveness of the country. I will not bother you with the methodologies, but what we do is we assess every country on three dimensions. The first dimension is the quality of the education system, what we call investment and development. The second factor is what we call appeal, that is the ability of the country to attract and retain talent. And the final factor is readiness, which is the availability of skills and competencies in the talent pool. That is, to what extent companies find the talent in the country that the economy demands. That's also extremely important because sometimes we can have excellent education systems that actually do not result in productive economy. Let me compare here two important examples. The first example is Switzerland. In Switzerland, the education system is very well designed in that it fits the economy with the talent that the economy needs. The Swiss economy is based primarily in two sectors, banking services and capital goods. So not surprisingly, the Swiss education system produces 
bankers and engineers. If you ask around any of your Swiss friends, they will be either a banker with a degree in economics or an engineer. The rest in Switzerland is a big loser, okay? And, and they, they have to find other opportunities. I will not say that this is the best education system, but it's the best education system for what the country needs, okay? On the contrary, think about what happens in Spain, in my country. In Spain, given our rankings, we have among the best engineers in the world. We rank in the top five of the quality of engineers in the world. We educate the best engineers, okay? In my family, we are five siblings. Four of them are engineers. I'm the only loser who is an economist, <laughs> at least for my mother. But guess what? Spain is not a country of engineers. Okay? Because if Spain is a country of construction services, tourism, and they don't employ engineers. Where do engineers go? Our engineers go to Brazil, go to Germany, but they don't find jobs in Spain. I'm still the loser because my brothers are, and my sister are working in Spain, but none of them works as an engineer. Okay? Some of them, they even work as bankers because they couldn't find a job to build roads or buildings. So that's the importance of an education system. It also needs to match the needs of the economy. And that's what we call the readiness factor, okay? Now, when you look at the intuitive ranking of a particular country, we tend to focus on the quality of education. We will say, for instance, that a country like uh, Singapore or a country like Finland, they excel in talent competitiveness because they have excellent education systems. But it is not necessarily the case if those countries either lose the talent that they have, are unable to attract the talent that they need, or the talent that they prepare doesn't fit the needs of the labor market. That's why if you look at our ranking, and here I'm going to show you some of the top countries together with the, the United Arab Emirates in the number 30th, is that the top 10 countries in our ranking, uh, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, Austria, Luxembourg, Norway, Iceland, Finland, the Netherlands are all countries in Europe. Only the 10th country in the world is Singapore that uh, has made it on the top 10 for the first time. The rest of the countries then include non surprising countries like Hong Kong or the United States. The United Arab Emirates for the reason that I mentioned earlier, ranks in the position number 30. If you look carefully at the factors underpinning these rankings, the first factor or the first column in the circles represents the um, investment and development metric, which is, again, the quality of the education system driven by investments of the government in public education. The number one country is Denmark, Number two is Switzerland. And you can see that, again, the top, top 10 countries include mostly European economies. Belgium, for example. The UAE ranks number 53. And that's you know, one, of the, one of the points that a country like the UAE can easily improve. And obviously, it's something that is in the agenda of the government, certainly. When you look at appeal, Remember, appeal is the ability of a country to attract and retain talent. And here, Switzerland is number one. And probably, by looking at my colleagues throughout this program, you have actually witnessed how Switzerland does this well. Because most of us tend to be foreigners that have been attracted to the country. Switzerland does extremely well at attracting talent, but at the same time, it also retains its own talent because it generates employment for Swiss graduates. When it comes to uh, attraction and retention of talent, you can see that the number two country, even though it ranks in the position number 12, is the United States. Again, not surprising to anybody, the United States is sucking talent from the rest of the world by providing high quality of life, high salaries, favorable taxes, and of course, overall, you know, an environment in which you, know, you can live in a very international environment wherever you are. However, as you can see from the United States, on the third factor, which is the readiness, number 28, 
the United States does not track on top. To what extent the education system in the country, including the one done by corporations, fits the needs of the labor market, here the number one country is Singapore. Okay? Singapore implemented a few years ago a policy that is called skills to jobs. Okay? And it's the most proactive country at designing an education system that completely caters the need of the labor market. And it is extremely flexible and adaptable. So whenever the education system is not providing a certain skill, it would be changed. When artificial intelligence became a dominant technology, the Singaporean government implemented changes in the curriculum at the schools that now provide training in artificial intelligence. When the labor market demanded coding at the expense of accounting, let's say, then schools in Singapore started providing this type of training. The number two country, when it comes to uh, appeal, is, uh, sorry, readiness, is again Switzerland. As I mentioned earlier, an education system that has been entirely designed to fit the needs of the labor market. Obviously, key here, countries have a choice. We can have an amazing education system that prepares our kids in arts, in philosophy, in science, in engineering, in math, in technology, but we can also make a choice to be completely targeted. And we know that we take a very biased view, because for us, at the end of the day, the objective is to assess the extent to which countries satisfy the needs of companies and then make those companies profitable. So competitiveness is not an unbiased concept. But you can see here that the countries that do well in talent competitiveness, they also do well in overall competitiveness. Okay? Just a small clarification question, Arturo. I guess the study assumes an equal weight to each one of these three dimensions yes. to come up with the overall ranking of talent competitiveness. Correct. Although, you know, we don't, rank the rank, we don't average the rankings, we average a score. So that's why when you look at, for example, in Norway, you know, the average of the ranking does not give you the position number six. There are statistics uh, behind that, uh, that make a little bit counterintuitive the numbers that you see there. Okay? So where does China sit? So you can see that if you look at all of the countries, unfortunately, we rank only 63 countries. That is, we don't rank, except for South Africa, any other country in Africa. And the reason why we are not doing that yet is because of the quality of the data and our access to those countries. We hope that actually through some of you, and we have already started to do so, in the coming years, we are going to in include some African countries in our ranking. So our 63 economies are also the ones for which we can get data. So to answer your question, you can see that China is in the number 42. Okay? It is true that China is making a big effort in, in competitiveness overall. But the education system in China is still uh, suffering massive underinvestment. Of course, I think, we are, I think we are fooled, or at least we are amazed, by some shining stars in China, in particular cities like Shenzhen or Shanghai. But if you go to the western part of the country, not only poverty level, but also education levels are extremely weak. And that's why China ranks so low. Again, you see countries here that are surprising because they are somehow competitive economies, the United Kingdom or France, but they are not talent competitive economies. The rising stars, that is the countries that have improved the most in the last years, are some economies in Southeast Asia, like for example, Thailand and Malaysia. But overall, and for the last three, four years, our ranking has been massively dominated by European economies. And as you can see, the strength of European economies, with some exceptions, is first of all, they have historically invested a lot in education because those economies see education as a massive pillar of economic development, but at the same time are also very attractive to foreign talent because obviously they provide quality of life in the form of safety, a, a, a policy stability, and you know, individual quality of life that attracts talent to those countries. Okay? Very often, there are some barriers to talent attraction that arise from language, or arise from the culture, or arise from the weather. You no, know? I always say the same, for example, about Finland. I did a presentation in Finland a few months ago, 
And when a government representative told me, how can we attract better talent? I told them, you cannot. <laughs> because it is very cold, the language is difficult to learn, and you know, it's uh, very difficult for people to move looking for a very better quality of life, especially if they are not used to that. Okay? That's, not a, that's not completely true, but you know, it gives you an idea that very often talent attraction depends on very external factors. Okay? Uh, here, the weather is fantastic. Tax rules are extremely favorable. Um, living conditions are great. And again, when you look at the talent attractiveness of the UAE, that remember is in position number 30, is definitely the best of all of the rankings of the country, in number 12. Okay? I can go through some individual case studies, and all of this data is too much for show because it's difficult to read. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on some particular uh, countries. For example, country number one in our, country number two in our ranking, uh, Denmark. And here I'm going to highlight the importance of each of these three factors. Okay? Denmark is the country that invests the most in education. This is typically the advantage of small countries. So small countries can devote more resources to education because they have uh, economies of scale in education. They don't need to invest in many other things. And at the same time, you know, they are extremely efficient when making policy choices because gaining policy agreement and policy consensus is extremely easy. Okay? Uh, Denmark is number two in government expenditure in education per student with 31% which is a lot. But, as I said earlier, Denmark is one of these examples in which talent attraction is not such an important factor. Again, that's not relevant because as long as the talent that the country prepares to the education system is good enough, then the talent attraction is not a problem. And as a result of that, Denmark is going to be ranked number one in the overall ranking. Look at what happens in the contrary with Singapore. Singapore is, as I said, a country where skills to jobs is a major driver of policy. So it's a country where the education system perfectly prepares people for the labor market. But then it doesn't need to invest so much in education. And it is true that depending on the variable that you use, you know, um, uh, in, in investment in education in Singapore may look uh, low or high. The, the world average as a percent of GDP in education is 4.7% across all countries. In Singapore, you can see there that the country only invests 2.7% only invest of its GDP in education. Okay? That's not all, because just for example, by contrast, the United States invests 7.2% of its GDP in education, three times as much as Singapore, even though the outcome of the two education systems is completely different, and is certainly better in Singapore. Okay? But in Singapore, you know, the investment in education is driven by the fact that you know, they don't need to invest that much given that most of the training happens within organizations. It's extremely flexible, but there is a lot of development that takes place for graduates that join a company and then they receive continuous education. Okay? And not surprisingly, in Singapore, you find that they have among the, mo the best management skills of the whole world because, of course, there are many, including ourselves, business schools that provide, tra provide training there. Okay. Um, however, when it comes to talent attraction and retention, Singapore is only number 20. Why? Because of the cost of living. The cost of living is a major driver of quality of life. And again, despite the environment, fiscal environment and regulatory environment, Singapore remains a very expensive country. Okay. Um, two more cases. And then I conclude, Switzerland, the country where many of us come from. Again, Switzerland tops in most of the rankings, but I want to focus here on the appeal, on the ability to attract and retain talent. As you can see, Switzerland ranks number one in quality of life, in salaries, both for management and services personnel, and number three in brain drain. That's very important. It also means Number three means that actually Switzerland loses very little talent to, to abroad. That is, Swiss graduates do not leave the country. Okay? When you look at the world map, you have an interesting comparison between 
net talent importing countries, like for example Switzerland or the UAE, and net talent exporting countries, like India or most countries in Africa. Okay. That is an important variable that I think governments should take care of. Because as I said, you know, that's one of the, the most or the fastest win of policy when it comes to retaining the, the talent. Okay? And finally, I just want to mention the, the UAE. You know, in the UAE, um, we, we mentioned earlier the lack of investment in education. That is, again, driven by several forces, but as I said, primarily, things that countries do not need to do it all well. And what the, the UAE does extremely well is talent attraction. This is a country that has based its economic success in attracting talent from abroad. And because of that, even though the education system is well designed and well functioning, doesn't require as much investment. Okay? This results in the last ranking in the country, number 13 in, in readiness. That is, the country takes, gets the talent that it needs, but it gets, gets it mostly from abroad. So, for countries, we are not worried so much about not being able to attract talent, but we are definitely extremely worried about countries that lose talent. And I mention that because we feel that in emerging markets it's becoming a big of a problem. And one of the major drivers of the digital inequality that I mentioned at the beginning was this idea that you know, countries are going to lose talent due to capital. That is, once ideas are generated, a country may lose its talent because you know, it is sucked into one of the two dominant systems. And I think that's going to create a different type of global, global inequality that uh, I think policy can resolve. Companies alone cannot do it by themselves. Okay? Let me conclude, the, conclude here. Um, I just give you there some more information. All of our rankings are publicly available, especially for our alumni. And if you want more details about a particular country of interest, you can visit our website. We launched the ranking two days ago. And I hope that at least this provides a useful tool for you to use in the companies where you work and also in the countries where you operate. Because at the end of the day, that's, that's our objective. Okay? Thank you very much. I'm ready to take some questions now if you have any. Thank you. So today we are not going to use the app. We'll do it live. So we have some microphones around the room. Please raise your hand if you want to ask Arturo a question or if you'd like to make a remark. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have one question, and it may be something that you've come across before, but I would like to hear from you. I think thank you so much for everything, the presentation of the numbers and all of that. I think a lot of work went into, into this, and it's evident enough. Uh, the question is, when you do encounter questions asking whether or not there could be some bias in the research. In the simplest of terms, how would you assure somebody that there was no bias, considering IMD is in Switzerland mm -hmm. and everything at the top there is Switzerland mm -hmm. and everything else, but in a nutshell, in the simplest of terms, without the numbers, the figures and everything else, mm -hmm. how would you assure yes. a layman Mm -hmm. that this yes. research was well thought and there's no bias in all of this. Yes. Thank you. And Definitely. then also, maybe referring to the past, using the same approach, when did IMD or when was Switzerland never at the top? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. Let me, let me actually take your point back because, in fact, what drives our, our results is the fact that we're in Switzerland, so, you know, we don't have any political agenda, obviously, and we're an academic institution, so we don't have any, any monetary interest. So uh, that's why we can be completely neutral. And our methodology is purely academic. Now, having said that, of course, when you look at Switzerland, you may think that we are trying to favor the country, and quite the opposite. 
Switzerland used to be one of the poorest countries when it comes to talent and competitiveness only 20 years ago. Okay? And it has jumped massively through actually good policies. Okay? So it has never been the same case. Okay? We're unlucky that uh, it is number one because, because it is difficult to sell, sell our results. But let me tell you something. I'm Spanish, you know, and my country is in the bottom 30. Okay? So if you think that I'm biased, I should put my country a little bit higher. <laughs> and I don't. Okay. Hi, Prof. Yes. Um, so my question is around um, the metrics that you used. Um, I mean, I think for some of them, um, and, and, and how we look at it, we probably will not find um, some of our African countries in there for quite some time, given um, its investment, um, appeal, and readiness. Um, maybe for some, we will, we will certainly show up in that, yes. in that metric. So my question is, what other metrics can we use to measure education um, in the continent and how it appeals to talent and talent development, um, given that um, I think a lot of these are more geared for more developed countries um, and not for emerging economies? Mm -hmm. I agree with you that for an African country today to try to focus on the rankings would be, would be a nonsense because, as you say, it will take forever. And it will take, I will not say forever, but at least a few generations to increase some of these metrics. But I think what we truly want to point out is that for a country, focusing on talent and education should be, if not one, the priority number one, at least one of the top three priorities of the economy. And unfortunately, in many countries, we focus on some other priorities. Sometimes we are distracted. And there are some countries that miss massive opportunities. South Africa is somehow a good example of that, because in a time in which the country could have done amazing things, you know, when it, and at times when South Africa was included in the BRICS countries and one of the economies of the future, it focused on other priorities. The same happened to Brazil, for instance. Brazil went through a massive period of wealth, strong currency, uh, economic surplus, high oil prices, and completely forgot to invest in education. Uh, and today, for example, still in Brazil, primary education is not mandatory. Okay? That's a big mistake, because politicians, especially in democracies, tend to focus on short-term agendas that do not drive long-term success. And what we're trying to emphasize is that education and talent should be a top priority. Okay. So how do you measure that progress? Um, because like I said, yes. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, so my question is, what, what metrics can then be used yes. um, for emerging economies, mm -hmm. given what you've just said? Yes. I, I will not list them, but our ranking actually identifies very simple key wins. Okay. Obviously, as I said, you cannot improve the quality of life in South Africa from one year to the other. But those metrics that are under the control of the government, especially those have to do with government investment and education, and sorry, and, and, uh, and education policy and regulation, can change very fast. And those fast countries, which again tend to be small economies, they do it extremely fast. Okay. The UAE is a good example of that. It's an extremely fast country when it comes to doing reforms. And whenever, something, whenever there's a weakness, it will change. Okay? And, and, and those are the quick wins. Again, investment and, and, and regulation are very simple to change. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to uh, address to the capital issue. You, you, spoke, you, you said that in the, in the United States and in China, there are a lot of capital available that will fool these new companies. Um, well, uh, in Europe, there, there are also capital available. It's a lot of capital also in some mm. countries, at least, in the banks, central banks, etc., etc. Uh, have you ever studied or do you have any, any ideas about why the capital in Europe is not available or is not available to assume the risk that new companies uh, need? Mm. Uh, is the ADN of this capital is not the same? The United States is more available to assume risk. What is that, that uh, the mm. capital in Europe stays in the banks? And in the US or in China, is putting the economies to, to yes. flourish. That, that's a very good question. You know, in Europe, um, we have very good seed capital. There is a de well developed venture capital industry. Uh, there is funding for ideas. Okay? Take the example of Switzerland. Again, there is no uh, digital giant in Switzerland, even though there is seed capital. And even though there is also a well developed stock market in Switzerland. 
what we miss in Switzerland, but also in the rest of Europe, is growth capital. That is, the ability for companies to slightly develop and at some time gain a certain scale. The best example that I always use is Logitech. Logitech was born in the country where I live and work, Lausanne, developed by two American engineers at the University of Lausanne, EPFL, that was extremely successful at the beginning, but then at some point they couldn't reach the scale that they wanted. Because the Swiss stock exchange is good for companies like Nestle or Novartis, but not good for companies that are seeking for growth capital. And at that point, Logitech moved to the United States. So what we lack in Switzerland, what we lack in Europe, is not stock markets, is not venture capital of banks or banks, we lack growth capital, okay? That will develop unicorns that then become digital champions. Okay, that's what we need. And for that, we need a particular set of rules, particularly governance rules, you know, rules to attract capital, uh, fiscal rules that promote that such a growth capital. Yes. So, um, uh, what about countries who are not mentioned here, who have a high export of talent, and I'm thinking of countries like Syria or like Lebanon, uh, one because of the war, the other one probably because there is not enough jobs for everyone. And how can now, how can, how can you bring these talent back, even if they have good education, because a talent export was because there was a good education, mm -hmm. uh, yes. at least mentionable, and uh, you don't have the capital, so uh, what do you do? Yes. I mean, so. Let me, let me first particularly about Lebanon and then the example of other countries. If you look at the country strategy for Lebanon that had been formulated a couple of years ago, in the 150 pages of the document, that by the way, you know, has been developed uh, together with a very famous consultant whose name starts with them, uh, you, know, you will not see a single page that talks about talent. The country's strategy, which is to, supposed to be long-term, focuses a lot on industrial policy, productivity, attraction of investment, but doesn't talk about talent. Okay? So that's very important. As I said, countries should focus on talent, development, and, and attraction. How do countries that start from scratch do that? Let me use the example of countries in Eastern Europe, like Romania, Hungary, Ukraine, Estonia. Those countries used to be newborn countries 20 years ago, but managed to generate and attract a lot of talent simply by using tax rules. Today, for example, if you are an IT executive, you can move into Hungary or Romania and you don't pay income taxes for five years. And that has driven a major wave of IT innovation in those countries. So they are becoming today IT hubs within Europe at the expense of countries like Germany or France. Okay? So I would say, first, focus on talent as a pillar of your strategy, and not so much on industrial policy. And second, you know, use the simple quick, quick wins to attract talent back. Okay? Portugal has, mass, uh, has managed to attract back a lot of the talent that the country lost by simply reducing income taxes to those who return to the country. Of course, in the case of Lebanon, there are other factors. Insecurity, you know, different political, the political instability, and this will take longer. But at least we should start with the policies that we can implement. Let me give you the microphone. All right. Uh, good afternoon. I think, firstly, let me thank the IMD for such a very event for a week. Uh, it has been truly life-changing. So my question to you uh, is basically on, there's a slide you showed around the ingredients of competitiveness, where you had innovation, talent, and governance. I have seen in most cases where there's a conflict between talent and governance, because in most big organizations, they tend to be very strong on governance, and that tends to lead to a high level of bureaucracy that tends to stifle our talent. And then these guys then, out of frustration, end up starting their own businesses, and that's how essentially fintechs were involved, and then they mm -hmm. ended up disrupting these big companies. Mm -hmm. 
Do you have a case where good governance and good talent have been able to coexist? And if so, what elements would you say or insights would you pick from that and how perhaps we can learn from that as we, as we go back to our individual mm -hmm. businesses? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I will delegate on my colleagues, uh, in particular my colleagues in strategy and innovation to answer that question because I don't want to step on their shoes. And I can tell you the following. You know, when we look at innovation in our study, what we actually uh, measure is not the output of innovation, but the input. That is, that is, to what extent internal processes within the organization then favor innovation. To what extent ideas that, for example, emerge at the bottom make it to the top. Okay? To what extent executives can take risks without being, you know, without having their jobs jeopardized. So that's an internal process which at the end of the day you can call innovation governance. And that's why both move in parallel. Okay? And the same applies to governance. We don't talk about the external governance, you know, investor protection, rule of law. We talk about the internal governance. And to what, to what extent companies have the right processes, so there is internal communication. So both have to be compatible. Okay? And, and again, if you look at the examples that my colleagues typically use, Tesla, Lego, Alibaba, you know, these are the companies that actually have the two of them in a perfect alignment. Okay? But I'm not the expert. I'm just an economist. Okay. I only predict the past. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Arturo, for your informative session. Uh, I have a question about appeal. Uh, how cost of living is impacting appeal? And specifically, when you mentioned Singapore, that yes. cost of living is it's impacting them and it's go, giving them low score, mm -hmm. while Switzerland, it's... I guess it's high cost living, but still it uh, yes. doesn't impact. Mm -hmm. Massively. So, uh, for example, the countries with the highest cost of living in our ranking are, are uh, Singapore and then Hong Kong, because we are ranking regions, okay, not countries. So these two actually have the highest cost of living. In the case of Switzerland, this is compensated by higher salaries, relatively speaking. PPP adjusted salaries in Switzerland are higher than in other countries. And that's, the, that's what explains the difference. Okay. All in all, higher salaries, even though you are expensive, result in higher quality of life. Okay. So that would be the answer. Yes, I think we have to go for the last question. Is that fine, Professor? Maybe two more. So two more. please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor. So um, I come from Sudan, which is in, an, in a very unique situation now, coming after 30 years of extreme instability where we're spending less than 2% of GDP on both health and education combined, mm -hmm. less than 2%. Um, uh, now we have, hopefully, um, a better future to look towards where, you know, after um, uh, stabi hopefully stability and peace coming to the country, we have what are called wind, uh, 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 positive windfall from the stop uh, of uh, basically an internal war that mm -hmm. we had. So funds hopefully will be available, available to be re redirected into education as one of the priorities. So my question would be, coming out of a situation of extreme low investment, what would be uh, maybe three areas of very quick wins and maximum impact uh, in terms of talent development that we could focus on over the coming five years? Mm. Yes, obviously Sudan has other must win battles to fight, okay? As a country that, again, starts anew. But I would mention, as, as again, following the lessons of other countries, number one, attraction of foreign capital, which requires better rules. The best example to follow here is Saudi Arabia and what it's doing today uh, to attract foreign capital. And then I always say that regulation tends to be a quick win. That is, if you look at, for example, and that's something that I've been talking about in my stream uh, on blockchain in the last, uh, yesterday, uh, regulation, you know, is extremely, is an, an extremely easy factor of success for countries that can create a significant competitive advantage, okay? So we can make a, a country like Sudan a, a major center for technology in a particular field just by having the right regulation. Of course, this requires some, something else, particularly capital. That's why capital attraction is going to be extremely important. And, and finally, you know, the typical 
uh, leveling the playing field when it comes to creating businesses, okay? which we have highlighted already for more than 30 years as a pillar of business and economic success. Ease of doing business, um, you know, rule of law, uh, licenses, bureaucracy, and so on. Okay? These, are, these are the three pillars that our case studies have shown to drive the success of a country. All right, thank you so much. Thank Arturo. you.